Hi, Doc here. I've been conducting a bit of an informal experiment as to whether people watch videos because there's physics in them or if there's uh, the human face factor. Do you want to look at my f f f face? Um, also, I wanted to tell you that I have grown a beard, so that's that. And um, the other thing is that, uh, well, we need to get back to physics. In particular, we're going to be doing some problems on the physics of music. So please enjoy this hybrid video with part face and part the traditional format. So our first problem here, 19.1, is about uh, a vintage Gibson, and this is a, a pretty typical length. Of course, they were measuring them in inches at that time. Unfortunately, it's just a stupid unit, but you can have a first, second, and third harmonic all happening at the same time if you hit that string really hard. Oh, oh, interesting thing. I was just talking to some of my trumpeters, well, all the guys from the jazz band, and um, one of the trumpeters almost passed out at their recent concert, and uh, I asked a little bit more about it, and it, I f came to discover that when the trumpeter was hitting the very, very high notes, you need to move a whole lot of air through. So there's some relationship between energy and uh, frequency. And it seems like as energy, uh, as frequency goes up, energy goes up too. So uh, that's something to keep in the back of your mind. That's going to be a general relationship we'll see several times in physics. But back to the problem at hand. I'm thinking you draw this guitar string and you draw it shaking in the simplest way, the second simplest way, and the third simplest way. And then you measure how long those wavelengths are. And uh, what's really cool is that the wavelength is not always the length of the string. And that brings us to the next question, in which I have a string, and I'm actually suggesting to you that of these six wavelengths, we can establish five of them on the rope. Wow, what poor formatting, though. Shame on you. I should have checked this. Sorry, sorry. Well, uh, it's uh, really cool um, because this works, and good luck with that problem. Oh, you should probably draw them. The sketch is very important, and then um, that'll help you to figure out which one doesn't work. So uh, there's something about singing in the shower. It's been a, a human desire since the Roman baths, of course. Those were also opera houses. And what we're going for is the, the richness of singing. But if you're singing on a soccer field, even if it's not windy or there's no soccer game going on, it's still kind of uh, dull to sing on a soccer field. Um, marching bands have a hard, uh, a hard role to play. Good luck. Uh, but it's much better if you put a marching band in a shower. I'm gonna stop this question. We're pretty much finished with it. Yeah, okay. So it's about standing waves, and this brings us back to like the 19.2 question, how are you gonna do that? This one is about a node or an antinode at each end, and we're taking that as a given, but why? Why does that have to be? Why not have neither a node nor an antinode at the end? And then, I guess, what would it be at the end if it's neither a node nor an antinode? And why would that be a problem with the standing wave? This is a really important question, although it might not be obvious, or maybe it's too obvious to be answerable. Well, okay, here's 19.5. How can historians estimate the sounds of the voices of people who lived before recording technology? This is awesome. You can listen to what we believe Benjamin Franklin sounded like. George Washington sounded like. George Washington had something really wrong with his face, as I recall. He wanted to only show one side because of some surgery. You know, there were teeth problems a lot back then. So uh, that is the end of the questions for uh, video 19 on the physics of music. So good luck and post any uh, answers that you might have or thoughts or, or questions for me in the comments. Goodbye.